It was nearly three decades ago that Mario Puzo captured the public imagination with the publication of The Godfather. It remains one of the top-selling novels in publishing history. He returns to the genre he knows so well with his new book, The Last Don, from Hollywood to Las Vegas to New York. He probes the workings of a whole new family and finds that there is little difference between organized crime and organized filmmaking. I am pleased to have him here to talk about his view of crime, the mafia, Hollywood, Las Vegas, and a lot of other things, and the craft and art of writing. Welcome. Thank you. I'm pleased to have you here. I'm pleased to be here. Why this? Now, I know that you have heard this question before, because some people say, the Godfather was so good, Mario, mm -hmm. don't come back right. to where you hit mm -hmm. a home run mm -hmm. and won the game. Well, it started out as a book about Hollywood. Yeah. Then Vegas crept in. Yeah. Then the Mafia crept in. And I don't quite understand the process you go through, but it, this was meant to be about a writer in Hollywood and all the machinations, you know. How the other people crept into the book, I don't know to this day. I mean, it's just something that happens. And I got infatuated with Don Clericuzio. Yeah. You know, I loved him, and so I kept writing about him. And how is Don Clericuzio different from Don Carleone? Don Clericuzio is a much tougher guy, less sentimental and less uh, closer to the real portrait of a mafia Don. Um, it's more realistic. He he really is the, the ultimate in wielding power. You know, it's pure power. The book opens at a scene in which there's a christening. Right. Two people who will end up in conflict. Right. One goes and ends up running a casino in Vegas. Right. The son of the hammer. Right. The hammer is the executioner. Right. The other Dante. Yeah. Not attractive. Right. Not as, in, not as, not made of this, not as charismatic. Right. I like him, though. You like him. <laughs> Why do you like him? Because? Because he's acting, he's like one of those crazy guys that can't help being what he is. You know, it's, uh, and to me, he had a yeah. certain charm. I, but he, was, he is the villain of the piece, you know. Is Ernest Vail you? Partly, sure. I feel very... He's a screenwriter. Uh, who, huh? who, he's a screenwriter in Hollywood who... <laughs> let me just say this, which is because anyone who's in our business knows who is so stupid, he believes <laughs> mm -hmm. that a percentage of net means something. Right. And, and it's one of the most terrible things because <laughs> they say you're going to get... Five percent of net, right? Oh yeah. Oh, we'll split net. They say, and you yeah, just know. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, there's no money there. There's no net, net. I, no matter how much money your movie makes, uh, there was that big movie with Tom Hanks, uh, Forrest Gump. Yeah. The guy who wrote the book got a piece of net. Winston Groom or something? What was his uh, name? What the hell? Was I think Winston that Groom. Yeah, right. 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 Winston Groom, and he got a percentage of net, and. Uh, the picture grossed 170 million dollars. He still hadn't it's had any a money. cent yet. And uh, <laughs> I mean, but there's millions of stories like that. Um, yeah. And it's it just so happens I have a very good lawyer, Bert Trials, who yeah. protects me on my contracts now. You know, but at the beginning, I took net. All right, I want to I want to come to that in a minute, but I want to stay with the novel. Yeah. It's about betrayal. Yeah. It's about revenge. Right. It's about what else? about money and God forgive me, true love, you know, <laughs> very dangerous operation. Well, let's talk about true love for a second. Yeah. You believe that a great man mm -hmm. with a great mission right. should never have a romantic love. He should have it if he keeps it in its place. <laughs> That's supposed to be funny. <laughs> You know, because the true thing is you can never keep it in its place. Yeah. Uh, I mean, history has proven that true love is dangerous to ambitious men. Takes your eyes off the ball. Right. Makes you do foolish things. Right. It makes you merciful. <laughs> it makes you merciful. Right. Well, and the romantic among us would say, 
but it makes life so much oh sure, sure. more satisfying for a while <laughs> 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 did you say, I think you did, maybe to your friend Bruce J. Friedman, that, that one of the joys of growing older, and you've celebrated your 70th birthday, 75th. women, beautiful young women, no longer have any power over you. I think that's a true statement. I mean, when you're a young man, you know, you're almost helpless in the face of beauty. You really are helpless. There's, you know... And when you're very old, or as old as I am anyway, you still appreciate a beautiful woman. But for one thing, you know you have no shot. And <laughs> another thing is, you really... Uh, it, it's like... I want to say this as diplomatically as possible. But they have no more surprises. Yeah. You know, when you get to a certain age... I mean, you think they have no more surprise. <laughs> I guess there's been many an old guy. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. But the, the, yeah, with Bruce, uh, I think I said that. And who knows if it's true? I don't know. Well, I'll talk more about your life. Is this for you? It's gotten very good reviews right. for the most part. Right. And those who quarrel with it, quarrel with it, say he shouldn't have come back here because it was a place of his greatest triumph and you can't be any bigger than one of the best-selling novels of all time, if not the best-selling novel of all time. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is as good as The Godfather? Do I think that's as good as The Godfather? In some ways, I think it's as good as... I think it's a cooler look at the Mafia, a colder look. Uh, I haven't romanticized as much as I did in The Godfather. I mean, in The Godfather, you could love them all. You know, they were all great guys, and uh, everybody was great. And I think this is a, has more of a colder eye on them. You can't tell... Like, my favorite book that I've written is The Fortunate Pilgrim. But who ever heard many, of it? How many copies did it sell? 5,000? Something like that. 5,000, 3,000. And you decided after that... Mm -hmm. I'm going to write a commercial success. Well, you know, a writer who's a failure is a joke in his family and friends, you know. And I always used to say, I can write a bestseller whenever I want, but I wouldn't, would never stoop so low, you know, I, too much of an artist. So I got really angry that The Fortunate Pilgrim didn't even have a paperback sale. Any book could have a paperback sale. And it got these tremendous reviews, you know, and I thought I was going to be rich and famous and... Everything was full. Nothing happened. And uh, so when he started teasing me, I said, I'm going to write a bestseller. And I'll you show were, you. You were over 45 then, weren't you? Right. When I made that decision, I was, let's see, 19, uh, I was 45 years old. And I published The Godfather when I was 49. But you say an interesting thing about that. You say you learn to respect the reader. Right. Uh, you weren't writing for yourself and to say how great I am. You were saying... I'm going to serve this reader. Well, when you're a young writer, you think anything you say is important. The reader must listen to you. You're the boss. But really, the rationale is crazy. Why should a reader not be catered to? I mean, readers read for pleasure. You have to please them. Uh, you, you don't have to sell out to them com completely, but you can write a good book and keep an eye on the money which seems to me a reasonable way to operate because uh, a lot of very talented writers quit writing because they write a few be beautiful books, they make no money, and they give up. I mean, it's just psychological. Like, I, if this Godfather had not been a success, I don't think I would have written another book. The great example of that is... Um, who's the guy? Henry Roth that wrote the book about... Jew, I can never remember the name. Philip Roth? No, not no, Philip Roth. No, Henry Roth. Roth, I mean, uh, Henry Roth um, Call It Sleep. Right. Which is, a, to my mind, a, a very great novel. But he wrote that novel. He didn't make any money. He became the owner of a duck farm. He did all time. Then he wrote 40 years later, whatever it was, he started writing again. Well, to me, that's a terrible life. Sure, he wrote a great novel, but he had a terrible life. And in my eyes, that's not worth it. What do I care if I wrote a great novel and I lived a miserable life? Yeah. 
Should, shouldn't I have a nice life if I write a great novel? What have you learned about money in your life? I'll tell you, money is great. Uh, the, the great thing about money, it takes a lot of worries off your mind. Like, if your tire gets busted. Before I wrote The Godfather, that was a tremendous calamity. The cost of a tire was something you had to lay awake at night saying, how am I going to pay for these tires? When you make money, you can... Well, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Right after uh, I made all this money, the week after my wife went shopping, and she brought me back, she says, there was a blue and orange dress, and I liked the orange one better, so I bought the orange. And I had to tell her, you can buy both. <laughs> she didn't grasp it, that she could buy both dresses. Yeah. And I didn't grasp uh, I, I was a big user of the public library. Yeah. I always went to the library for books. I think it was two years after I made the money on The Godfather that I bought books. I still kept going to the library. And then it occurred to me, I can buy these books. I don't have to wait on the waiting list and whatever, you know. And that, that to me is what money does. You know, it, yeah. it makes life easy. But you also think, m tell me the story. And this was a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. Charlie Blutern. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my partner, who, who yeah. built Gulf and Western, he put owned, it together. Yeah. Great conglomerate. Yeah. Of one of the properties was Paramount Pictures. Right. Two of his employees were Michael Eisner. Right. The chairman of Disney now. Yeah. Barry Diller, and who Je was Michael Eisner's business. Yeah, and Jeff, and Jeff Kat Katzenberg, who's now one of the three partners at DreamWorks. The three great giants. And you're at a meeting, and you and Bluthorn, I think, in the Dominican Republic... He invited me down. Where he had a big whatever. And we were partners on writing a treatment. We yeah. wrote a 60-page treatment together. And he wasn't bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. okay. He had a story to tell. Yeah. And uh, we went back up, and we have a meeting with Mike Eisner and... Barry Diller. Barry and, Diller. And, and, and Katzenberg. Je Katzenberg, who's the big killer, was in the back shuffling papers right. and keeping an eye on us, yeah. you know. He was a junior partner there. Yeah, and... Uh, I was being a New York wise guy because I didn't depend on movies for my living. I had a day job as a novelist. So I said to Barry Dill and Mike Eisner, I said, you guys are going to find it really hard not to like this script. Because Blue Dawn was in the room. Blue Dawn owned everybody, right? Yeah, they worked for Blue Dawn. Right. And a look came into their eyes. I mean, it was like a chilly, chilly look. Kill his eyes. And I knew right... I, I said to myself... It's, I'm dead. This, this, will this never project be is, made. Uh, and it never was made and, <laughs> until I think 12 years later I wrote a new script. And it said you, these guys, these businessmen, are, are real, as every bit as tough as anybody I write about in these oh, books. I tell you, they, they scared me to death. Dylan and Mike guys, and they, when they looked at me when I said that, I said I, I, I thought I was going to be shot. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't get that. That's true. That's an amazing story. But you saw that killer in their eye. Oh, you saw I, that ability to say, not on your life, right. Rizzo. They didn't not care if Charlie life. Blue Dawn earned the firm, and they didn't yeah. care anything. He Just doesn't pay me enough to, to get back this pictures that are not going to work. And, and also to work with a wise guy like this, you know. <laughs> the ca there is also this, and I have to touch on that. There is some, there is the notion always floating around that somehow you know the mob either because you were made or B, because you know them and they enjoy your company because you have romanticized them in a certain way. I never knew them before and I never knew them after. Uh, I met a couple after who really believed I was, they said I could have not have written that book unless I had access to the top guys. And uh, I, I was going to try and play the role of the guy who knew everything, but I thought better of it. And I asked my host, who are those two guys? And one of them was Johnny Rosselli, who was a big yeah. ended, up, ended up in a barrel off the uh, coast of Miami. Right. right. And the other guy was the guy that was in the room with Bugsy Siegel when Bugsy Siegel got shot. So you can draw your own conclusions. But they told me, you could have never written that book unless you knew Frank, Frank Costello. Right. And for a minute, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I know these guys, you know. Then I said, no, I don't. Because they look a, a little ominous to me, you know, they, they had that certain look. And did, then I, I was glad that I didn't. Yeah. 
You also said something very wise. Somebody was enjoying the company of Joey Gallo. And my friend Bruce Friedman. Bruce J. Friedman, right? Yeah. And he was enjoying it, and, and he was telling you about it, and, and you said to him, not very intelligent. That's right. I remember saying To hang that. out with Joey Gallo. Yeah. Well, I had done my research, was, and uh, it was obvious that Joey Gallo had to be killed sooner or later. You know, just from the research I had done. Yeah. And uh, I, I really was frightened for Bruce that he was hanging out with him. You know, it was, to me, a very dangerous thing to do. Screenwriting. Well, I'll come back to the Mafia in a second. Mm -hmm. Screenwriting. You also say that if today you were 25 and not 75, mm -hmm. you'd be in Hollywood. Right. You wouldn't be sitting out in your little yeah. writing studio trying to create the great American novel. Right. Because I'm a lazy guy and I'm, I like pleasure. And the life of a screenwriter, I mean, you've got the great climate, you got... Yeah. Great looking women, you got you get paid more for a screenplay. I've gotten paid more for a screenplay than I've made on any initial draft of my novel. You, know, you write a screenplay for a million dollars and fourteen other screenwriters will come in and you don't care because you got your million dollars. I got, you're the, out of I got the million up front. Even if they don't like it, they pay you the million dollars. <laughs> yes. uh, to me it was such a great racket. Yeah. I couldn't believe that they would give me so much money for doing what I did. And you know, screenwriting the guys that earn a living screenwriting, it's a, you know, it's a tough job. You got to know your stuff. But to me, writing a screenplay was like stealing. You know, I was always afraid they'd lock me up instead of paying me. You loved what Brando did. Oh, sure. And I love what Fran Francis was. Francis Coppola was the key to Godfather One. How was that? Because he cast it. He fought with the studio, and it was his. It was a genius movie maker and. He did everything with that book that I would want to be done. I mean, to me, it was such a great pleasure. I didn't know that much about the movies. That was my first job. But as the years went on, I realized how much he had done to make that a great movie, that it was Francis Coppola. And, um, you know, I was always so grateful to him. Uh, Is the movie better than the book? Uh... I think what you can say is that Godfather 1, if you pick the 20 best movies of all time, you would have to include that movie. I don't think you could say the same thing about The Godfather. It's a different thing, uh, diff different evaluation. You want to write Godfather 4 yeah. as a screenplay or a novel? Screenplay. As a screenplay. Yeah, I would never write a, another book and... In my contracts in movie writing, they can never make a novel out of Godfather 2 and Godfather 3 or Godfather 4. Uh, but I would love to write the screenplay of Godfather 4 simply because cause I have a very clear vision of what it should be, you know. And uh, I You think want to go back to the James Conn figure uh, yeah, uh, I and, want and James, as a J young man. J Jimmy Conn would be the hero, Sonny growing up. Right. It would really be his story. And I think that would fit in perfectly with the structure of the movie. You like Sonny more than Michael? No. No? Uh, it's just that Jimmy Kahn gave the part so much yeah. juice that people always remark upon. Al Pacino, I think, is a great actor. He's really a great actor. Uh, he, in Godfather 3, which was much less than the other pictures, I think, uh, Al gave a stunning, stunning performance at the end when his wife, when his daughter gets killed. He gives you, like, some breathtaking moments, you know, just really great acting. Why do you, how are you able to make a mafia seem real? Why is it that your gift is to make people believe that you really know what you're talking about? That's what a writer does. That's what a novelist does. I think of myself more as a, in terms of being a novelist than a writer. It's a special craft. Storytelling? Or yeah, storytelling. And it includes everything. You know, it's like, it's like a whole separate world. You build a world, and, you know, you live in it for a while. And to me, that's the attractive thing about writing novels. Besides the money. Boy, you sure capture Hollywood in this book, though. Oh, yeah? Thank you know, you. and Vegas. Uh, but especially Hollywood, the characters yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, and you have said with so much money to be made <laughs> in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, that those people are. 
Well, there's so much money at stake that they're fearless. Fearless, you know, that's the word you yeah, use. They're, yeah. they're fearless. They don't care about the mafia or anybody. They yeah. can fight with them. I'll tell you when, you, when I looked into Barry Diller's and Michael Eisen's eyes, it was more scary than looking into Johnny Roselli's <laughs> eyes. I'm sure they'll be pleased to hear that. Wow. <laughs> Mario Puzo, The Last Don. The, the title you really wanted was the... Uh, the Clericuzio. And, and some wise publishers said, let's try The no, Last... No, everybody said. Everybody said, nobody can pronounce that. Yeah, so uh, go with The Last Don. Yeah. And they were right. I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's great to have you. Come uh, back anytime. Okay, yeah, I will. Pleasure. Thank you. Very much. And, you know, I'm a fan of your program. I oh. watch every night. Thank you. Mario Puzo, one more time. The book is The Last Don. When we come back, Drew Nemperant, he is a great restaurant entrepreneur and from a man who loves food to a man who makes a lot of money with food. Back in a moment. Stay with us.